Okay, so as we come to think about the words that we've just been singing and reading, let's bring that before the Lord and ask that he would speak his word to us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words of that song that we can just sing joyfully in our hearts, that he is a wonderful counsellor, mighty God, everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. We thank you that you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and we can worship you. Lord, we pray that you would now speak your word to us. Lord, you don't need our praise. You don't need our worship, but we do need you. And Lord, we pray that you would now fulfill the greatest desire of our hearts, which is to draw close to you and to become more like you. Lord, speak to us through your word now. Give us understanding, give us clarity, and just may my words be your words now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So everything this morning is essentially gathering around this key passage, Isaiah 9, and the key verse is obviously verse 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And as I look at this, I simply want to ask a single question, and that question is up on the screen now. What are you waiting for? And I'm going to phrase that question different ways because there are two different ways you can really look at that. And we'll come on to that later on. But what are you waiting for? Have that in your minds as we go through the passage today. What are you waiting for this Christmas time? I understand that I'm speaking this and asking this question, not just to adults and the majority of whom are Christians and have been Christians for many years, very experienced in their faith, very mature in their walk with the Lord, but for children as well. Perhaps as young Christians, maybe some here who are not Christians and even those who are listening in on the Internet who have perhaps found this YouTube video and have never really thought about this. And this is new to you. Well, let me ask you this for Christmas time. What are you waiting for? Is there a present or something special under the tree or elsewhere around the house that you are absolutely bursting to have like Crispin on Christmas, Christmas Day, Crispin the pig? What are you waiting for? Well, we've just been reading in this passage about the people of Israel. It was a difficult time for them. You think about Isaiah, the prophet, hundreds of years before Jesus Christ. And the people, it was later on in the history of Israel, they turned away from God. And it wasn't going very well for them. Captivity in Babylon and all of these things. Perhaps asking, where is God now? Not realizing and failing to remember that actually it was their sin that was Uh, It came as a warning against them that God would deal with it. He would carry them off and they kept ignoring him and they've had trouble and strife. And we read here in those first few verses that this comes to them in a time of difficulty, in a time of gloom, a time of anguish for the people of Israel. And to them, this passage would have been really welcome news. Imagine if you were those people of Israel and you've got all of this trouble and strife. And God speaks to Isaiah the prophet and you're hearing what Isaiah is saying. And he's saying that there's going to be an end of trouble and strife, that things of war and and, and, and all of this bad is going to cease. It's going to be done away with. That even dwelling in darkness will become light. We're obviously talking only spiritually speaking there. And you know what? That would be an admirable thing to desire, wouldn't it? For the people of Israel to think, you know what? I can hang my hopes on that. God's telling me that this is going to get better. I can desire that. Back to the question I ask you, what what are you getting this Christmas? Is it going to be something that you really desire? Is it something that you're going to be dreaming about? That maybe you're thinking, wow, this thing, I've been, you know, really wanting it all year. And I've been laying all my hopes and dreams on it. This thing is going to make my life better. I'm going to be more popular. I'm going to look better. I'm going to sound better. Whatever it is. Is it going to make your life better in some special way? Is your heart set on it? And... Maybe if you developed almost an irrational love for it, you just almost can't wait for Christmas morning for this thing that you've got. Have you been taken in by the promises of its creator, whatever the latest gadget is and the advertising and whatever it is that is told you wonderful things? That If you have this thing or you get this item or you buy this, it's going to do this for your life. It's going to change you in this way. And you believe the hype of its creators. Our thing will do this for you. Our thing can end your trouble. Our thing can make you smarter, faster, bigger, stronger. And have you 
been drawn in by that. And that's your desire. And that's your hope this Christmas time. Remember what Andrew was preaching on. And he shared with us last Sunday about the Argos catalogue, the book of dreams. If you get one of these things, your dreams will come true. Amazing things that we can have. Well, we can settle our hearts on things of this earth, can't we? But, you know, all of those things, they fall short of a magnificent gift. In fact, the greatest gift of all. The people of Israel in this promise, in this passage, well, they were promised an end to war, an end to poverty and even spiritual darkness. They were promised that things were going to get better. And imagine their excitement. Put yourself in their shoes. God was going to do this amazing thing. He's just spoken through Isaiah the prophet. How is this going to happen? How is God going to deliver us then? What is he going to do to make this better? Maybe. Maybe he's going to send a great warrior king like King David of old. Maybe he's going to restore Israel through a big, powerful king on a big, mighty war horse. And he's going to come charging in to Babylon or wherever we are. And he's going to rescue us. And people will stamp the authority of Israel back on the map again. And we will be a great nation again. Maybe that's what he's going to do. Maybe we're just going to broker a peace deal with the nations around us and they're just going to let us sort of settle back down again. Maybe God's just going to have all our enemies just, you know, put down their weapons and walk away. You know, God says he can do anything. Maybe people are just going to stop fighting with us. Maybe we're just going to stop having the oppression upon us and maybe things will just suddenly work. I don't know. The people were in spiritual ignorance at the time. These prophets were trying to keep them on track. Well, what do we read? Isaiah says, this is all going to end. All this trouble is going to end. How is it going to end? This is going to happen. That's going to happen. And we come to verse six, four. This is going to how it's going to happen. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. God was going to give them a baby. Now you can imagine right now the Israelites some of them may be old and wise and wizened in their ways. And they're like, whoa, stop. Stop, Isaiah. What? You're telling us there's going to be an end to war. There's going to be all of this is going to be brilliant for us. We know we're not going to be in poverty. The yoke of our burdens because a baby? Don't you mean a, a warrior baby? No, unto us a little baby. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is going to be given. Yes, you heard me right. God is going to make all things right by giving you a baby boy. That doesn't make sense, does it? God was going to save his people. And this prophecy wasn't just looking at the nation of Israel. This prophecy is for all people, as we know. God is going to make everything right on this world with a baby boy. And you can imagine that the people probably weren't sure how to take that from Isaiah when God gave him this prophecy. And not only that, Isaiah goes further. We read in the verse, that God tells Isaiah about this baby boy, four claims that he's going to make about this baby boy. And these are amazing claims. They're not, he's going to be very, very strong. He can run fast. He can pull a bow and shoot an arrow really accurately. No, these are the claims of a baby boy who's going to come to wipe out all these problems. He's going to be a wonderful counselor. Okay. He's going to be mighty God. He's going to be an everlasting father and the prince of peace. That's the claim for this baby boy. Now, I have to say to you, if you first heard that and you were perhaps the Israelites or even you're just listening now and you're hearing that the Bible is telling you that salvation to everybody is going to come through a baby boy who's going to be all these things. They are very audacious claims. That is a very arrogant thing to say about a baby boy. And you know what? In normal everyday circumstances, that would be right. That would be a very audacious and arrogant thing to say. But this is not ordinary circumstances. This is not an ordinary boy. This is not a normal everyday human being, is it? How can this be? Well, let's look at the claims. And this morning, I simply want to go through the four claims. And I don't like to apologize in advance, but I feel I must. I probably aren't going to keep to my notes because what I'm looking at here, I don't want to be tied down with just these things that the Bible is telling us. And uh, and so as we go through, we're just going to look at some of the verses in the scriptures that help to reinforce each of these four things. And I'll just go through them in turn. So wonderful counsellor, first of all. You know, when we think about a counsellor, we think about the council, don't we? Your, your district council or your local council 
or we think of a counselor at school like a career counselor or maybe you know you don't get sent to the head you get sent to the counselor if you've been naughty some schools have those as well and counselors are usually very formal aren't they it's very official and things like it sounds an official thing i am a counselor it sounds like an official thing you don't normally put the word wonderful with counselor do you no counselors advise they manage they guide and they're supposed to be wise and understanding to help you and to show you things. They're thoughtful and they're intelligent, but they're probably very boring, not wonderful. And yet here we see that he's the wonderful counsellor. And on top of that, I think it's fair to say that our understanding of the word wonderful, I think it's really lost its essence. You know, when we see things on uh, WhatsApp or on your Facebook with a family, we say, you know, Oh, that's wonderful when, you know, your nephew or your niece has just lost their first tooth. Oh, it's wonderful. Well, it's not, is it? It's nice. It's a good thing. It's a happy thing. You know, they're growing up. It's an experience. But it's not wonderful, is it? You know, think about what that word actually means. Wonderful. It means to be full of wonder. I looked it up in the dictionary. Excellent. Great. Marvellous. It, it causes and arouses a sense of wonder, amazement, and astonishment. These are really big, heavy words. That's what wonderful means. And we're going to put that in front of counsellor. When's the last time you were truly amazed or astonished? Ask yourself. When you were truly stepped back and full of wonder at something that was just so majestic in front of you. Well, Jesus is the wonderful counsellor. He shows that in many ways. We're just going to briefly look at a few ways of how Jesus is the wonderful counselor this morning. First, in his teachings, you think about all that Jesus did and he taught. Luke 2, 47 tells us all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. That was Jesus in the temple, age 12. He was still a child. And yet the, the, the religious leaders, those who were leading them spiritually, were amazed at this young child's understanding of the scriptures and of the ways of God at age 12. They were amazed. John 7, 14, 15, in the middle of the feast, Jesus went to the temple. He began teaching and the Jews therefore marveled. And they said, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? Jesus Christ is the word of God. And the people marveled at his understanding of the word as he taught them. Matthew 7, when Jesus finished these sayings, the end of the Sermon on the Mount, when he finished these sayings, the crowd were astonished. They were astonished. You might be astonished when you've been to a, a rugby match or something. You've seen like some final thing just tweaking and it's just one and whales have suddenly come on top for once. And you're astonished at the amazement of that last minute play. These people were amazed. They were astonished at Jesus' teachings. For he was teaching them, it says, as one who had authority. And not as their scribes. And obviously, Andrew's been going through the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 to 7. And he was showing them, he was unpacking and teaching them what the law, excuse me, what the law actually meant. How to really interpret it. How to apply it. And they were just blown away. They've never seen anything like this. Jesus is that wonderful counselor in his teachings. In his miracles, Matthew 8 the men marveled. They said, what sort of man is this that even the winds and the seas obeyed them? Jesus has just got up and told the winds and the waves to be quiet. He has just told off the weather. We can't even control the weather. We don't even know what it's going to do tomorrow with all our supercomputers. Jesus got up and told him what to do. Amazing. Matthew 9, when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, never was anything like this seen in Israel. Matthew 15, the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Wherever Jesus went in his teachings and in his miracles, in his healings, they were astonished. They were amazed. They magnified and glorified the Lord. Nothing like this has been seen before. And also in Jesus' example, his example as a whole, as a person. Matthew 22, Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? When they tried to challenge him about the tax, paying tax with the coin. And they said to him, it's Caesar's. And he said to them, 
Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard it, they marveled and they left him and went away. Jesus always had the right answer. He always lived the right kind of life. Everything that he said and did backed up who he is. A wonderful counselor. Hebrews 4.15 tells us, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, face the same difficulties as we do, yet without sin. Jesus, by his example, by his teachings, by his miracles, showed that he is that wonderful counselor. His wisdom surpasses ours, doesn't it? 1 Corinthians 1.20. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For even the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. Jesus, his wisdom surpasses ours. He sees the bigger picture. Isaiah again, 55. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways, says God, higher than yours. And my thoughts than your thoughts. And Jesus knows you better than you know yourself. A counsellor has to be able to look into you and be able to understand you so that they can guide and direct you. Jesus knows you better than you know yourself. Psalm 139, the psalmist records, Oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You have known when I sit down, when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. Even before a word is on my tongue, you know it already. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me to understand. I cannot attain it. The psalmist understood. He saw the greatness and the glory of God. He saw how wise and understanding God is. The Bible says in Colossians 2, 3, in him, that's in Jesus, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Jesus is the wonderful counselor. This baby boy would grow up to be the wonderful counselor. We move on to mighty God then. Nobody likes to appear weak, do they? None of us do. Even as, as people in the UK, even when, you know, things are going terribly and everything's gone horribly wrong. The house has fallen down, the car's blown up, the children have died or whatever. And we're like, oh, it's and people are like, oh, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. I'm coping. You know, we don't like to. It's almost like a politeness, isn't it? But human beings, they don't like to appear weak. We establish ourselves. We try to make a name for ourselves. You think right back to the Tower of Babel, the people then fearing being broken up and becoming weak so they tried to make a name for themselves and we see it today with with countries and alliances i've seen it in the military side when countries come together to be stronger and more stable together we desire things that will help us to become bigger and stronger more respected and more recognized it might be the gift that you're looking for that you desire what are you waiting for this christmas time is going to help with that maybe you think it's going to make me bigger and more respectable it's going to make me look nicer or fancier it's going to help me to get fitter and stronger yeah we don't like weakness do we but you know what having the coolest toy in school boys and girls or having the smartest phone or the fastest car whatever you're waiting for this christmas time even the biggest house or the fanciest holidays there'll always be someone come along with something more than you and you know what when you look at mankind all you see as well if you're watching this online right now and you're thinking to yourself well there's always going to be somebody with more than you that's going to come along. And they're always going to be looking and seeing somebody with more who's going to come along. And mankind are always striving for more. And those who have more just strive for more. And it never ends and there's never satisfaction. Not so with Jesus Christ. He's not only our wonderful counsellor, but he is also the, not a, the mighty God. He is bigger. He is stronger. He's faster. He's more powerful than literally anything else in this existence. There is nothing that can be compared with him. Psalm 89 says this, for who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are? O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. Isaiah himself writes later on in, in chapter 42, thus says God, the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out to spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to all people and the spirit to those who walk in it. I watched an article online recently and it was showing the problem that evolution has with the existence of the universe because it has to get around something called the horizon problem, which is all about light and how fast it travels with stars as the universe expands. And you know what? A creationist scientist have got together and realized that when the Bible says that God stretched out the heavens, 
He says it five times just in Isaiah. He says it in Job and he says it in Ezekiel as well. You can read it if you look it up. That when God stretched out the heavens, actually the way that space and time and mathematics and physics work, that actually is a very plausible way of how the universe could have worked. That God made the stars also, as we read in Genesis, and then he stretched them out. And that's how the universe can physically be the way it is today. Creation has the answer. It's incredible. And when you read there, the power of God, the might of God, as Moses records, as I said in Genesis, he just he made the stars also. It was like he just did it for his glory. What an amazing God. In the New Testament, we read of Jesus Christ in the four Gospels and elsewhere doing the wonderful and mighty deeds, some of which we just thought of and healing the sick. Casting out demons, opening the eyes of the blind, making the lame walk, removing leprosy, rebuking the weather and raising the dead. If this is not power, if this is not might, I would like someone to show me what is. I've seen a great many powerful things in my time in the military, but I've never seen the kind of might and power that's recorded by eyewitnesses in the Bible. God's gift is mighty. Jesus Christ, that baby. The wonderful counselor, the mighty God, he is mighty to help. He is mighty to heal. He's mighty to hold you up and to be with you. He's mighty to save you. He's mighty to guard you and to guide you. You don't have to be afraid. He's there with us. Psalm 20 verse 7 says, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. That wasn't written by some measly weakling scribe. That was penned by the greatest king that Israel ever knew, a mighty warrior called David. Some trust in chariots, but me, I'm a mighty warrior. I'm going to trust in God, in my mighty God. That's what I'm going to trust in. Jesus Christ is the wonderful counselor. He is the mighty God. And he's also the everlasting father. Now, again, we think back to the gift that you're thinking of. What are you waiting for? What are you craving for? What is your desire this Christmas time? You know what? I'm going to break it to you. Nothing lasts forever. OK, you may desire this greatest thing. It may have the appearance to benefit you in some amazing way. Like I said, it may even have the ability to increase your standing. You might look better in a sharper suit or a lovely watch or a great big toy or a new smartphone or a car on the drive. And it might look great. But you know what? None of these things are going to last forever. And you certainly can't take them with you. But God endures. God is unchanging. God is unbeatable. God is unstoppable. He's unwilling to give up. There is nothing that God does not know. There's nothing that God cannot do. John 10, 28, Jesus says, I give them. I've got the authority to give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all the mighty God. And no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. We are together in this. And this is eternal life we're talking about, something that lasts forever. If you're truly saved, you can never lose your salvation. We know that God's kingdom, which is full of the people who are saved, can only ever increase. It can never diminish. It says here in Isaiah of the increase of his government and his kingdom, there will be no end. God's kingdom can only ever get bigger and stronger. That's amazing to think about. It will never, ever diminish. God doesn't just know the end from the beginning. God is the beginning and the end. Remember what Jesus says before Abraham was, I am. It's the covenant name of God, but he's making a point. Jesus has always been and he always will be. He is that everlasting father, isn't he? Revelation 1, 8 records, Jesus says, I am the alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come. He is all of eternity. He says the Almighty. Revelation 22, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. God's perfect gift, this Christmas time, if you choose to accept it, is more than just this life. It's more than just something that will last until New Year's Day, or last for the two years of its warranty, or last till the batteries run out. Jesus Christ, God's gift of salvation, will last forever and it will never end and it will never diminish. Luke 23, 42, the thief said to Jesus, hanging there, bleeding and dying on the cross, seeing Jesus for who he really is. And he said to him, Jesus, remember me 
when you come into your kingdom, you realize who Jesus was and he put his trust in him. And what did Jesus do with his blood shod face, the crown of thorns, struggling to breathe, struggling to hold himself up? Jesus turns that thief and he said to him, truly, I say to you, this day you will be with me in paradise. I can't think of any greater words to hear than for the saviour to say to me. I am your gift of salvation. You will be with me in paradise. Beats anything that's under your tree. God's gift is forever. Paradise, heaven is forever. Jesus Christ, God's gift, that small baby, is the wonderful counsellor. He's the mighty God. He is the everlasting father. And finally, he's the prince of peace. Jesus Christ is the prince of peace. A prince is a ruler, isn't he? Or, well, yeah, he. Somebody who is groomed for leadership. You think of our own royal family. You think of Prince Charles and William and Harry, etc. They're groomed for leadership to govern and to lead their land. And Jesus Christ leads. He leads and we follow. How does he lead? He leads with peace. He's the prince of peace. Throughout his time on earth, he continually pointed people towards peace as the way forward. The Sermon on the Mount, again, Jesus said, and Andrew preached on it, go back and listen to Andrew's sermon. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Part of God's family is to be a peacemaker, to follow the example of the Prince of Peace. With his disciples, Jesus said numerous times, look it up. I only put one verse in, I could have been here forever. John 20, Jesus said to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Many times when Jesus then met with his disciples, on the storm and they're afraid after he'd risen again and he kept appearing to them peace be with you he said peace be to you he said jesus was an advocate of peace he came to make peace but it was peace at the highest level not just peace between excuse me between one arguing neighbor and another not between one community and another or one country and another or a world at war jesus came to make peace at the highest level between a just God whom we have offended, whom you have offended with your sin. And mankind, us, who have offended God. That is the greatest conflict in the universe. Our rebellion against God and our sin against him. And Jesus came to broker peace at that level, the highest level. How did he do that? Well, he made peace by taking our punishment on the cross. Colossians 1, 19 to 20. For in him says Paul to the Colossians, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile, to bring together all things to himself, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Jesus took the punishment for your sin and for my sin. That's how he made peace. God said sin must be punished. Jesus said, I'll take the punishment for your sin. He broke it at the cross. And because of this peace that he broke it on the cross, paying the punishment of death that we should pay, he can now offer that peace to us. He is the Prince of Peace. He tells us that we can be at peace in this world, no longer stressed, no longer anxious or afraid. John 14, 27, Jesus said to them, this was before he was about to be betrayed and go to the cross. He said to his disciples, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, not the worldly peace, which is temporary, which is fickle, which can fail, and does fail, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid, says Jesus. Well, you might be thinking to yourself, well, how can he offer such peace? Why? Because Jesus Christ has overcome the world, because he accomplished that mission. He said himself, my favourite verse, it's got me through many um, dark and troubling times, John 16, 33. I have said these things to you so that in me, you may have peace. Jesus was honest with his disciples. He said, in the world, you will have tribulation. But then he says this, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus hadn't yet fulfilled his mission. He hadn't yet died and risen again for our sins. And yet he could say confidently in the future tense, I have, sorry, past tense, I have overcome the world. He offers us peace because he's already overcome the world. He has already fulfilled his mission. Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. And I'll finish with this. Back to that original question. What are you waiting for as you come to Christmas time? What are you waiting for? If you're hearing this 
and you already know Jesus Christ is your savior, you are a Christian, then you've already admitted your guilt before God, the father, and you've accepted the sacrifice that Jesus has offered you in your place. Well, then be encouraged as you hear these words, as you're reminded of your savior this Christmas time. Remember what Christmas is all about. Maybe you've lost that focus. Maybe in all the hardship of this year with COVID and separation and furlough and job losses and family and physical and mental well-being, it's been a real struggle for you. And so you're just hanging on to maybe just seeing family this Christmas or just having that toy or that new car that's going to be able to get you to work or that new job that starts in the new year. I would urge you and encourage you as Christians, don't rely on those things. They're wonderful things, they're gifts God has given, but keep that desire. Make sure that what you're waiting for at Christmas time is to remember to celebrate your saviour coming to earth, Jesus Christ, the boy who would grow up to be the saviour of the world. And if there's anything in your life that is in the way of that, maybe something you're waiting for at Christmas, then I would say put it to one side, bring it to God and ask him to refocus your heart and mind upon him. And lastly, I bring this out to anybody who's sitting here right now, men, women, boys and girls. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your saviour right now, if he is just a name in history to you right now, if he's someone that you've heard about at Sunday school but don't believe him, well, let me finish with this. Let me finish with this challenge. You might be thinking that all of what I've said today is too outrageous to be true. You, you know that Jesus Christ was a person in history, etc. Or maybe you've been taught at Sunday school, but you don't believe that he's God. You don't believe that in, in Jesus or whatever. Well, do you know what? Jesus Christ is actually one of the most proven people in human history. That is a fact. That's an academic fact. He's more proven about in his life and his works than any other person in ancient history. The eyewitness accounts about his life, his works, his teachings, his miracles, his death and his resurrection, his ascension to heaven, have been forensically analysed and they cannot be debunked. They have not yet been debunked. Nobody's been able to disprove Jesus Christ. It would be everywhere. It would be all over the news. After 2000 years, Jesus Jesus's church, the Christian church, it has been attacked. It has been persecuted. People have tried to destroy it and diminish it. And yet it is stronger now than ever before in human history. And you know what? The more that people, very clever, very learned, very understanding academic people who have tried to disprove Jesus Christ, the more who have tried to do that, actually, the more people have concluded that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. And so I would challenge you, if you're hearing this and you're not a Christian, Jesus Christ is God. He is Lord and Saviour. He really is who he says he is. And so I bring that same question, but I pose it in a different way. What are you waiting for? Why are you holding back? Accept Jesus Christ. Ask him to be your God, to be your saviour and your friend. And you too will know his peace. The greatest gift this Christmas time and any time is Jesus Christ. He will be that wonderful counsellor. He is the mighty God. He'll be the everlasting father. He will be your saviour and friend forever. And he will bring you peace as the prince, as the ruler of peace. What are you waiting for? Accept Jesus Christ this Christmas time. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for what your word tells us about him. And we thank you for the uh, plethora of evidence that even then highlights and reinforces that word that shows that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is that baby in the manger that grew up to be the saviour of mankind. Lord, I pray that every single Christian hearing these words today would be encouraged and rejoicing in their hearts that they have been saved by this wonderful counsellor, this mighty God, everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. And for anybody hearing these words who is not a Christian, who has never thought about Jesus Christ, who is perhaps unsure and curious, or have heard the stories, but it's never really clicked. Lord, would you open their hearts? Would you help them to see Jesus for who he really is this Christmas time? Not just a cute baby in a manger, but someone who is mighty to save, somebody who will last forever, somebody who will bring peace into their lives, which is desired above all else, and somebody who will counsel and guide and lead throughout their time here on earth. Gracious Father, would you save souls as we remember Jesus Christ this Christmas time. Bless us as we continue in our time of worship now. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.